With Good of War, the engine took a major leap towards uh, forward regarding its uh, visual capabilities. Like most projects overhauled, uh, the overhauling of Godot's renderer, render pipeline forced to make many or thousands of little decisions going forward with the future of the render pipeline. And today, John Clay is here, the leader of the rendering team of the Godot engine, who, wants to who, who will tell us about the future of the render pipeline in Godot and mm, the many great visuals that will come from it. So, applause for Clay. Thanks, thanks everyone, and thanks uh, for, for the nice introduction. I'm feeling very welcome to be here, and I hope everybody feels, feels welcome here. Uh, so, uh, as he said, we've been really busy. Um, we've been working super hard these last couple years to make it 04 everything that we wanted it to be, and it's, it's good. I'm very happy with it, and I'm always looking forward to what's next, and unfortunately that means I always feel like things can be better. And so today I'm going to talk about what I think and what, what we've talked about and, and discuss what we think would make things better. And hopefully you agree. There will be a Q&A period afterwards, so feel free to, to ask questions about things you don't understand and feel free to ask about uh, things that you think we, we might have missed. If you have a lot of questions, you can always find me at lunch and I'm more than happy to chat about this sort of stuff. So. For, for a little context, uh, I started contributing to Godot in 2017. So at that point, we had released Godot 2.1. Godot 3.0 had not yet come out. And it was, you know, the big thing. It was going to change everything. And it, everything was going to be really advanced and really nice. And things have changed so much from, from then. Godot 3.5, and we'll be releasing Godot 3.6 soon, is just totally different from, from Godot 3.0. Uh, and now we have 4.0, we're about to release 4.2, and I think 4.6, 4.12 are going to be totally different, and, uh, and I'm really hoping to see that same sort of progression that we've seen over the last uh, six years or so. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to talk about, uh, so that's fun. Um, so first I want to talk a little bit about the current state of things as of 4.2, I mean, we've been releasing betas and we've been talking about what we've done so far, but I know a lot of people won't know exactly what's, uh, what's coming or what the state of things are, so I want to kind of uh, introduce that. And then I want to talk about our priorities. And this is going to be a bit of a discussion about how we decide what, what our priorities are, how we decide what we're going to work on next, um, and how we kind of deal with uh, conflicting uh, needs and desires from, uh, from, from the community. Then we're going to talk about short-term plans. So these are things that we've talked about. We're all fairly certain that they're things we want to have in the engine and we want to have in the engine quite soon. Uh, and quite soon means, you know, maybe six months, maybe a year. Um, we'll get working on them soon and hopefully have something that's ready and merged into the engine. Uh, in a shorter, more reasonable timeline. And then finally, I want to talk about some long-term ideas. And you can see I don't call these plans, I call these ideas, because they're things that we're talking about, but we don't know if we'll actually do them. Um, we don't know if when we do them, they'll look anything like what we have, have in mind now, but they're the sorts of things that um, we're thinking about and talking about because we want to be ready for uh, you know, the next generation of things and for the future. And we want to make sure that we're thinking about our future now so that we don't get ourselves into a position where we have to go back and rewrite everything again because that's essentially what we did already for, for good 04 and we don't want to do that again. So important disclaimer, I'm talking about new features today. That doesn't mean that that's our focus going forward. We are still totally dedicated to working on bug fixes, stabilizing things, making things run faster, making things easier. Um, it's just that for a talk, it's more fun to talk about new features. So that's what I'm going to talk about. But don't take any of this to mean that we're not totally dedicated to uh, fixing the things that are currently broken or smoothing out the things that are a little bit bumpy right now. OK, so the current state of things. 
Um, as most of you will know, we've got a few different uh, rendering backends. So we've got what we call the RD renderer, and the RD renderer is our Vulkan based renderer. It's for modern systems. Uh, it works well on newer phones, it works well on desktop devices, it doesn't run on the web, it doesn't run on 10 year old devices, and for that we have the compatibility backend. And the compatibility backend is very similar to the old uh, good old GLES2 renderer. Uh, it's not GLES2, it's GLES3, but the architecture is very similar to the GLES2 renderer. Um, and so the state of that is it's mostly done. Um, the 2D render is totally done. It's very fast. It works really well. And for 2D games that are targeting mobile, low-end desktop, web, it's working quite, quite well and we're very happy with it. But for, for 3D, there's still more we want to do. So some of the more advanced 3D features that um, you might not use all the time, uh, we haven't implemented yet. And I'm going to talk more about that and what our plans are for it later. But uh, for now, just know that it's not 100% where we want it to be in terms of features. But um, it's getting there and should be there fairly soon. And then for the RD backends, this is our high-end stuff, right? This is the, the exciting stuff. This is where the, the new features go because this is targeting uh, higher-end devices. It's targeting uh, more recent devices. Okay, we're having microphone problems. Um, okay, so um, that's the RD backends. We're quite happy with where they are. So things are um, performing okay. Uh, things are looking really good, and I know you're going to see some demos later this weekend that look really good, um, so be excited for that. But uh, we know performance can be better. Uh, we're working on it. Um, for some scenes, it's great. Uh, for other scenes, uh, we need to do a bit more work. And then certain effects are not up to the quality that we want them to be, and you know, this is a, it's a time constraint kind of thing. We get things working so that 90% of the time it looks good. And then if your game falls into that 10%, it looks terrible and doesn't work at all. And we need to do a lot of work and, and we're getting there. And then finally, the last thing, and this, this is a bit more, more technical, but we, we right now use a very rigid rendering pipeline. So what that means is we make certain assumptions about uh, how your game should be rendered, so what order the steps happen in, uh, what sort of things are going to be done. Uh, and this is nice for us as developers because we just say, okay, A, B, C, D, that's the order that things happen in, and then we're good. Things are fast, we can optimize for that. But then if your game doesn't fit into uh, what we have in mind, then all of a sudden you run into barriers and you're like, well, I, I want to do this. And we smile and say, no, you can't, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> or you know, well, you know, I'm doing this thing that seems so simple. Why is it performing slow? And we go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is going to perform slow, but this will be fast. And you say, well, I don't want to do that. I want, you know, I want to do the thing that I'm already doing. No, no, it's going to be slow. Sorry. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so uh, we want to provide more flexibility. We want to provide the tools so that users who are really pushing Godot uh, can tweak things or, or really control things that they want to control. And, and that will allow people to get uh, really high performance when they need it and really flexible kind of alternative styles and things when they want to do it. But this is subject to the constraint that for regular users, we want regular users to just be able to not worry about any of that stuff and just have things work, which is the, the state now. For most people, you just throw all your stuff in, it works, you don't think about it, and you move on. Um, okay, so uh, talking about priorities. So following up on that, number one priority is ease of use, right? Uh, it's something that makes Godot really unique. You don't need years of experience as a game dev to start using it. You can just start using it and things work. And then when you get more experience, you learn new things and you're able to push it further and further. And, and that's what we want to keep. We don't want to sacrifice that early core experience in order to make people, you know, be able to make really big games or really you know, different, different things. We want to make sure that that core experience stays the same. And then it's also possible to, to do something more advanced or do something really big once you, once you know more and you know 
how to take advantage of the tools that, that are available. And then next up are stability and performance. So I touched on those before, but like for a game engine, these are just of the utmost importance. Uh, and, and of course, they're things that, that uh, we find extremely important too, right? So your game needs to run. Uh, it needs to run as fast as possible so that you can do as much as you want. And it needs to actually work on all the devices that you want to ship on. And we care about that too because um, you know, we ship Godot to every Godot user because the Godot editor is Godot. And so our users need Godot to work well and our users need their games to work well. And those two, uh, two things are really closely aligned. And so uh, we, we tend to spend a lot of time trying to uh, stabilize and make things work well. So now these are priorities that we're thinking more about going into the future. Uh, they don't reflect uh, how we've been, been making decisions. They're more reflecting how we're making decisions about what we do next. Uh, so I've already touched on this quite a bit, but we want the engine to be more flexible. We want uh, more advanced users to be able to do more diverse things with the engine, and we really want to empower those users to, to do the things that they want to do. And for that, the engine needs to be more flexible. So in terms of rendering, that means things like custom rendering passes. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I'm going to talk about it later, so I, uh, I won't spend any time on that now. And we want users to have more powerful shader authoring. So right now we have a very, uh, what I think is a very approachable way of authoring shaders. Uh, it's a lot easier than <laughs> just getting started with raw GLSL or, or a shader language, um, but uh, it's limiting. And so we want to provide something that's less limiting and gives power users uh, more, more control. And then the other thing is scale. So um, when you're making a 3D game in Godot, you can only make the game so big. Uh, there are technical limitations for that that I'll, I'll talk about later. And then I'll talk about what uh, our solutions for that are. And in particular, how we're going to do that without making small games extremely hard to, to make. Because right now, if you're making a small game, it's super easy. If you're making a huge game, it's extremely hard. We want to keep small games easy to make, but we want to make it possible to make uh, large games as well. Um, so that's just larger, uh, larger scenes, primarily. OK, so now this is um, the, the process piece, right? So. Um, we have a lot of ideas. Uh, a lot of us have uh, diverse experience in, in the industry. We're coming from different places. Uh, we think we know what, what should be prioritized. And so uh, we meet a lot and we talk about things. We write blog posts and proposals. Uh, we go on social media and we talk about what we think we should work on. And then we listen to people. Um, and that's, I mean, it's, it's easier to say than, than to do. but. We really try to stay engaged with people. And again, this is in our meetings. We have public weekly meetings that people can come to and, and talk. And uh, we get a lot of feedback on our blog posts. So we try to write lots of blog posts so that we get more feedback. We get a lot of feedback on our chat platform. We get a lot of feedback on, on social media. Um, and so we really try to engage with people and understand what their needs are um, and how we can solve their, their needs uh, in a way that makes sense uh, within, uh, within Godot. Uh, and in doing that, we have to prioritize certain things because we have conflicting, conflicting things. Some users are saying, I, I, I want to make Assassin's Creed in Godot. Uh, please make that possible for me. And we say, OK, uh, we'll try. <laughs> we'll do what we can. Um, but I, ultimately, the, the needs that we spend the most time on are when people say, I'm making this game, um, you know, I'm partway through my project and I'm running into this limitation. And I cannot finish my game unless this is lifted. Everything else, like everything works great in Godot, but I'm running into this thing, what can we do? Uh, and that gets super high priority, right? Because we want to uh, focus on the known needs of our current users and we're really trying to avoid the speculation of, hey, I'd love to use Godot, but it has to support this. Um, or else I won't touch it. And then you know, we implement that thing and they don't come anyway. So now we're just maintaining a feature that nobody uses. So we really want to implement things that we know people are going to use. The people who are using the engine know they're going to use it. Um, 
And that, for us, is, is ideal. And so that's why uh, these three things are, are up top, right? To, to me, the, this, this is the way of serving our current users, right? Uh, we make things easy to use. We make sure that our current users are empowered. Uh, things are performing well so that they can make the things they want to make. And we make sure that everything we have works well. And then this is about expanding things for our current users and for future users. So now you can hopefully do things that weren't possible before. You can make the game that you wanted to make, but you've been keeping on the back burner because it's just not going to work, uh, work with Godot. Um, but ultimately, we have to deal with these uh, conflicting uh, demands. And it can feel a little bit like this. So <laughs> on, on the one hand, you have users with like incredible systems because they're software engineers. And so they've got the best computers and everything. And they're using Godot, and they want all the fancy effects. And then we've got a lot of people. Uh, that are working on, on laptops or older systems, especially people in, in the second and third world that use, use Godot, they don't have NVIDIA graphics cards and they certainly don't have the 4090. And so for them, like, we could implement ray tracing, but it, it does nothing for them. And it takes a lot of time for us. So um, we, we try to find a balance between these things. Ultimately, we do our best to support both, uh, both sides here because Next-gen features today are totally standard features, uh, or yeah, and next year, right? Um, so we want to support those things. We want to support them a in a decent amount of time, but um, you know we're doing that within the constraint of making sure that we are helping everybody. Um, so th this is a slide from our 2023 poll, and what you can see is. Uh, you know, the high end, this is specific for GPUs, but the, the high end devices only make up about a third of our current user base. And we had about 8,000 response. Oh, you can see 7,671. Uh, it's a pretty good, I think, representation of, of the community. And so if we focus on low end features or, or medium end features, we're serving two thirds of the community. And if we focus on high end features, we're serving one third. So that's a, it's a significant amount either way, so we have to focus on, on everything a little bit. Um, but it, it, it does help us decide uh, what we're doing. And this goes without saying that uh, we also have a lot of mobile users. So w we can debate having high and, and medium end features, but uh, on mobile devices, like the, the, current, the current gen on desktop is going to be current gen on mobile in 10 years, right? So to properly support mobile, we need to be thinking about next gen and last gen, and we need to make sure that everything works well, and we can't just abandon uh, a huge part of our user base. So uh, this is, again, from, from the poll this year. You can see 35% of the community is targeting web, 32% Android, 9% uh, iOS, uh, and everybody targets Windows on top of that. But um, this is an important part of our, our community, and we, we don't want to leave them behind. And we don't want to just focus on things that uh, only a subset of, uh, of our users can, can work on. So with the process out of the way, these are a few of the things that we think we'll be starting to work on very soon. Some of this we've started work on and expect to have finished soon. Uh, some of it we're hoping to start soon, and we'll see, uh, see when it gets, gets finished. So I, I promise to come back to the, the compatible, compatibility back end. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, so we're working on some of what we consider to be the more uh, advanced effects. So uh, in particular, things that we'd like to work on soon are SSAO, that's screen space ambient occlusion. It's, it's responsible for making corners a little bit dark. Um, it adds a lot of realism to your games. I promise if you don't know what that is, if you do know what it is, I trust that you're excited. Um, volumetric fog, uh, we have that supported in the RD renders. Uh, we're going to implement it for the compatibility backend, but in a different way, in a way that's not going to look quite as nice. Um, right now, the volumetric fog in Godot is very crisp. It's extremely fast, and it looks amazing. And on the compatibility backend, it's not going to look as good. It's not going to be as physically accurate but it's going to run on low-end devices, and it's going to run in the compatibility back end, and so we're, we're quite excited about that. 
And then Glow, of course, we're all familiar with, with Glow and we love it. Um, and then uh, on top of that, things like reflection probes, light maps, uh, these are things that you just you need for, for 3D games. Uh, they're not supported, so the types of 3D games you can make in the compatibility renderer, uh, it's still quite, quite limited, and um, they're things that we'll implement as soon as possible. And we're going to implement them uh, from the user-facing perspective as similar as we can to uh, the RD renderers, but ultimately, um, they're going to be using less accurate versions, more optimized versions of things that are much better on, on that hardware. So they're not going to look quite as good, um, but they're going to be fast. And that's, that's our priority for, uh, for the compatibility back end. Now, this is my favorite slide. I'm going to go through it really fast um, because it's all technical stuff. I have a lot of notes written here, and uh, I'm not going to cover it all. <laughs> so the acyclic graph, this is extremely uh, exciting for me. Uh, this is a tool that solves a very specific problem that we have in the Vulkan backend uh, that I hope uh, nobody here knows that we have. <laughs> and, but it's a problem for me, and so this is something that's going to make the life of rendering engineers better. Um, and ultimately, uh, what it's doing is it's something that runs behind the scenes. Uh, it, it keeps track of all the GPU commands and GPU resources that we use. And then it reorders all of the commands to make sure that everything that can run in parallel runs in parallel. Things that need to wait on other things properly wait on other things. And what it means for us and for users who are using the rendering device directly is they don't have to worry about uh, parallelizing their GPU code. They don't have to worry about um, putting barriers in between different commands. You just tell Godot what you want to do and it'll reorder things so that uh, it's as fast as possible and, um, and just work. So it's going to make the experience for rendering engineers a lot uh, more comfortable, and uh, it should come with a lot of performance benefits too. Naturally, uh, this is going to improve GPU performance, uh, but it's going to cost a little bit of CPU cycles. So we'll be tweaking it to, to find a good balance, but uh, it's something that we think is going to make, uh, make a lot of things just work very, very easily, and the cost should be quite minimal. Now, this is a problem, um, a really big problem. Uh, Vulkan and the modern APIs introduced a concept called pipelines. Um, pipelines are a thing that bundles together everything you need to know about rendering before you render something. So it's, it's got your shader, it's got your material info, it's got your blend mode, things like that. Um, a problem that we see in pretty much every game that releases these days is the first time an object comes onto screen, you get a bit of a stutter. And like AAA studios are struggling with this, we're struggling with this. Back in the old days of using OpenGL, there was no good solution for this. We came close to a solution, but in the end it only worked on some GPUs with certain drivers and really only on, on newer stuff. And it's still a problem today with, uh, with Vulkan. So we've got some, some ideas that we can do uh, in order to reduce this. Uh, and that is uh, quite complex, but it, it's similar to what we did in Godot 3, which is using what we call an Uber shader approach, um, and then uh, compiling pipelines in, in the background. If you want to talk more about that, come find me later. It's a very technical topic, very exciting for me, um, but not well suited for today. Uh, and last, uh, we will hopefully soon start work on a metal renderer. So metal is the equivalent of Vulkan, but it runs on Apple devices. Um, we have a translation layer that translates Vulkan to metal, um, and it works. Um, that's about it. it. It works, but it's, <laughs> it's not as fast as we want it to be. It comes with a lot of problems, and it's super hard to debug. Um, so we want to write uh, a metal backend we have the infrastructure there, we just need, uh, need to do it. Um, okay, and now something more exciting. Um, so the compositor uh, is our solution to customizing rendering. So a, a compositor is something that uh, organizes rendering passes and what that means in practice is it's something that allows users to control the order that rendering happens in. 
So we've got some tools in, in Godot to control the order of things, but they're, they're not perfect. Um, and I'll, I'll explain uh, what that means. So right now, if you want to render something in Godot, you start from a viewport, the viewport renders the camera, and then you do this uh, step called culling. So that's anything that the camera can't see is just thrown out. Um, and um, if you have occlusion culling turned on, it's like things that are hidden behind other surfaces are also thrown out. Uh, and then we go to render the, the scene. And that looks kind of like this. Um, so we do a pre-pass, then we do a TAA pass. So that's objects that are, are moving and they need to write out to special buffers for TAA. Then we do an opaque pass, we draw the sky, and then we draw transparent objects on top. Um, the TAA pass and the opaque pass are where all your opaque objects are drawn. So that's most of your objects. Uh, the trouble is, for certain effects, um, you want something to be rendered first, or you want it to be rendered last. Uh, and right now, you can kind of do that. Uh, you can use what we call the render priority setting and, and give it a high priority. But uh, if you want something rendered first and it's in the opaque pass, it's going to be rendered after everything in the TAA pass. So it actually ends up rendering somewhere in the middle. Um, and vice versa, if you want something to be rendered last, but it's dynamic, the best you can do is the middle. You can't make it render last. So uh, the solution that we've come up for, um, for this using the compositor is to allow users to create their own custom passes. So that looks kind of like this. So you'll do your depth prepass, then you do TAA pass one, opaque pass one, and then TAA pass two, opaque pass two. So if I want something to be rendered first, I put it in pass one and it renders, and then everything else can be in the other passes, and then uh, rendering continues as normal. So this is something that's extremely important for using stencils, for using custom depth testing, for implementing terrain blending, which is a uh, important feature if you want to have a modern terrain system. Uh, it's used for geometry decals and other custom effects. So I'll, I'll give an example of this. Uh, a common problem that users have is you want to render a boat and you've got a water plane and water fills your boat. And of course the GPU doesn't understand that water should not be inside a boat. So users have to come up with all kinds of different ways of making sure the water is not drawn where the boat is. And that can be really annoying. Uh, and so uh, GPUs have a tool for this called stencils. And so what stencils allow you to do is you write to a special buffer, the stencil buffer, and that draws the boat. And then when you go to draw the water, you just say, don't draw where the boat is. And the boat will have an ID, like maybe one. And so then you get something like this. Uh, this is actually from a, a Unity project. It's a <laughs> because we don't support stencils yet, <laughs> which is why I'm talking about this. But it, it's actually a pretty cool project. It's a totally open source, community driven demo project. Um, it was unfortunately cancelled, but um, it's still pretty cool, <laughs> and I, I'm happy it exists. Um, so, okay, back to um, this. So. That, that's our solution for this, this problem, but the compositor does more than that because there are other effects that users want to do, um, and you sometimes want to do more than just adding another opaque pass because obviously there are more things in your scene than opaque objects. Um, sometimes you want to render, um, for example, portals or mirrors where you're rendering the scene again from a different angle but you want it to render to the same viewport. You don't want to render to another viewport and then copy everything over because that's needlessly expensive. So um, this is, again, the, the high level of what rendering looks like. You go through rendering your camera, culling, render scene, and it appears there. And then we want users to be able to do this. Render your camera, call, render scene, and then before you do post-processing and copy to uh, the 2D renderer, uh, We'll just do that all again. We'll do it with a different camera. And you can do really uh, fancy, uh, fancy effects like portals combined with stenciling where you only render the area that's in the portal. And then you can render a portal really efficiently, really easily, um, and it should, should work well. And obviously, um, look at all these little boxes. This is an advanced, <laughs> an advanced thing, but those are advanced effects, right? And so we. This is an example of a, a situation where 
uh, we're trying to keep the normal process for, for users the same, and then we're adding something advanced so users who really want to do those things can do it. It's going to take a little bit of knowledge, and it's going to be a little bit more complex, but you'll be able to do it, and um, ideally we're going to have some really good tutorials and stuff in, in the future. So um, what you end up seeing here, um, if you're rendering with multiple cameras, is you end up doing this full pass twice, uh, and that allows you to do uh, a lot of things. And then, of course, uh, if in the second pass you're not rendering a sky, it doesn't render the sky. And if you don't have transparent objects, it doesn't render transparent objects either. And then something I'm not going to talk about because um, I want to get through the presentation within my time slot is we're also going to allow inserting callbacks between these passes. And so that'll allow you to write GD script code or C sharp code or whatever scripting language you use. And then you can insert code between the passes in order to you know, add new rendering commands that we, we wouldn't be putting in there. Um, and that, so that allows you to script, script the pipeline a little bit. It's not a scriptable rendering pipeline, but it allows you to do some, uh, some things you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So uh, on to shader templates. So this is what a shader looks like in Godot. Uh, like I said before, we keep things simple. Um, you write to some specified outputs. You have some specified inputs. Uh, and all of those come from uh, our big shader. So we maintain shaders that are thousands of lines of code so that your shaders can be tens of lines of code. But ultimately what happens is we take your shader code and we just shove it into ours. So that, that's the whole shader I showed before and now it's sitting within, uh, in, within our shader. And so what it means is you're kind of stuck with the decisions that we make about, about the shader, right? If, if we uh, make the shader slower to make it more correct or make it look a little bit better, you just have to live with that decision because your code gets inserted into ours. Um, and what we want users to be able to do is not make the same trade-offs we're making. We want users to be able to make their own trade-offs. We want users to be able to implement their own, uh, their own shaders so that they can do whatever they want. So, um, you know, the big question is what do we do about all this stuff? Until now it's been, it's been necessary. So that's what the, the idea behind shader templates are. They're the everything else around your shader. So our idea is uh, we'll have a new resource type. It'll be shader template. When you assign it to your material, instead of using the Godot template, for lack of a better word, you'll use your own. Uh, and ideally, what you can do with that is implement totally different rendering styles. Like if you want to, for example, write a tune shader where you accumulate all the lights and then you apply a stepping function to the accumulated lights, this is a heavily requested feature, by the way, uh, you can do that. Um, and then for other users who don't care about that, we don't need to add weight to the, to the shaders to support that. Uh, you, can do it, uh, you can do it yourself. The idea is this is something you could specify in a, um, in a th world environment or on a material or on a shader itself, um, and then it'll just, uh, just work. And then also, of course, if you want, you can just delete 90% of our shader code and have super fast shaders because you know exactly what you want, and what you want is to render a lot of things even faster than, than you can normally. Um, now this is a fun topic. You can already see what, uh, what's going to happen here. Uh, we've worked really hard on improving our TAA in, in the coming up to 4.2. And, and now what we want to do is leverage that really good TAA in order to optimize a bunch of effects like GI, AO, uh, shadows. So this is an example of the difference that using TAA makes on shadows. This actually didn't make it into 4.2, but it should be more merged for 4.3. So you can see up top, uh, the shadows look a little bit blocky. Here that is close up. And then with TAA optimization, that's what it looks like. So we're hoping to apply that to SSAO, to our GI. And what that means is if you are OK with this, um, you can just turn your quality settings to the lowest, make shadows super fast, um, and then you get a free performance boost. And if you're not OK with this, then you can have this. <laughs> and then it also allows us to, to move to some more modern techniques. So this, this is SSAO. 
Um, it adds the little uh, dark spots and cracks. On the left is what we currently use in Godot. This isn't a screenshot from Godot, by the way, but uh, it's the same technique. Um, that's what we currently use. And then on the right is uh, a more modern version of the same technique. So it looks a little bit nicer, a little bit crisper, and it takes about 70% of the time to render. So it's faster, it looks better, we want it. Um, okay, now this is a fun buzzword. A lot of people will be familiar with deferred rendering. Godot uses a forward renderer, which means that we render our lights at the same time that we render an object. Um, I'm not going to go any deeper into it than that. What a deferred renderer does is uh, you render some the information about your objects to the screen, and then you take all of that and you render your lights after. So you combine those slices and then render your lights. Um, realistically, this is a performance optimization. Uh, it's something you do when you want to have a lot of lights in the scene and you want to have really complex shaders. Um, Ford renderers struggle with something called VGPR usage, and the solution, unfortunately, is to write a different type of renderer. So <laughs> we'd like to have an option that you can toggle to turn on deferred rendering. Uh, it's less flexible. Um, in certain cases, it's more difficult to use. But for people who know what they're doing, turning it on should just improve performance in a lot of cases. So it's an option we want to create. And we've set up our architecture so that it shouldn't be too uh, onerous to, uh, to add this. So we'd also be getting rid of the depth prepass, which is another performance saving uh, tool. Um, we'd provide access to these buffers to VFX artists. Uh, so there are a lot of cool techniques that people are familiar with from Unity and Unreal, and they want to implement them in Godot, and we say, sorry, <laughs> you can't. We're a fundamentally different type of renderer. Um, by adding this, we would unblock a lot of those, uh, those people. And then we'd also unblock um, some other rendering techniques that just don't work um, in Godot right now. So one of those is, is something called deferred decals. It's also sometimes called mesh decals. Um, what it allows you to do, it's a very cheap way of adding uh, detail onto things. So a lot of times this is used to like add screws onto sheet metal without rendering you know, a hundred thousand polygon screw, you can just um, throw it on top and, and it'll look quite good. Okay, and this is kind of what the process looks like when you use a deferred renderer. So uh, you start with some basic information, you calculate lighting, which is the bottom left there, and then you put it all together uh, and it ends up looking the same, uh, the same as it uh, would in, in Godot's forward renderer. Okay, so another kind of technical-ish thing um, maybe something people are familiar with, streamable resources. Um, so this is mesh streaming and texture streaming. And so the idea there is instead of loading the entire model and your 4K textures at once, you start with the uh, low res textures and you start with the low polygon version of the model and then you scale up in accordance with maybe how close things are to you with time um, and with how much VRAM you have. So this, this is an optimization for larger game worlds, but it's an optimization we're increasingly finding that our users need because people are adding more detail. They're having uh, you know, nicer meshes and they're having larger textures and they're bumping up uh, on, on limits. Ultimately, what this does, uh, importantly, it decreases load time. So if you're switching between different scenes, it makes that quite a bit faster and it allows you to manage VRAM effectively. So, for those of you making bigger bigger games, you know that in Godot, once you put too many things into your 3D world at once and you go over the, uh, the card's VRAM limit, things get really slow and your only option is to start removing stuff as fast as you can. And we don't have an automatic process for that. This would allow you to set a limit that says, this card has four gigabytes of VRAM, do not go over that limit. Uh, and then the engine can manage memory for you and make sure you don't go over the limit. Um, and that's important for scenes like this. Uh, it doesn't look too complex. It's kind of stylized. It's really nice. But when you actually look at the detail required for something like this, you can see there's a lot going on. So, like, you know, these are high, high resolution textures. They look amazing up close and from far away. 
And <laughs> this is a really high polygon model. And if you want to render this efficiently, you have to have some form of, of streaming. And of course, we're all familiar with streaming bugs. <laughs> so we're looking forward to introducing these into Godot as well. <laughs> Um, this is the downside of streaming. If, if you've got a slow hard drive or if you've got limited VRAM, uh, then suddenly your cutscenes might look like this for a second or two. Here's another famous example. I think this is on a PS4, um, and that's an important character as far as I know. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, we're always working on polishing our VFX pipeline. Uh, these days we're getting really good feedback really detailed feedback, and there are a ton of paper cuts for VFX artists. There's a ton of room for growth in this area, um, and people are already creating super, super cool things. So this is a, a screenshot. I pulled this from, uh, from a PR um, coming in Godot 4.2 from Cubiche um, that really improves uh, a lot of our particle systems. Um, and so we're, we're working on, on improving this stuff. We want VFX artists to have more control, obviously, more flexibility, um, but this is an iterative process. So we get feedback, we fix a paper cut, we get more feedback, and then as we resolve things, we have a much more clear direction of where to go in the future. And so this is a kind of a baby step situation where we're, uh, we're finding our way by slowly moving towards our, uh, our end goal. Okay. Pretty stuff. Uh, SDFGI. Uh, SDFGI stands for Sign Distance Field Global Illumination. Uh, what it is, it's our dynamic solution to uh, bouncing lighting off of things and into other places. Um, so here is what a scene looks like without SDFGI turned on. Um, and then when you turn it on, it looks like this. So notice how you get the darkness uh, inside the castle because the only light getting in there should be what comes in through the teeny tiny windows, the door, um, and that's it. So it gets much, much darker. This is how SDFGI sees the world. Uh, these, this is a visualization of the signed distance field. So you kind of take a simplified version of the scene. You use it to calculate uh, lighting, which is this is just the lighting contribution from SDFGI. And then you put that together and that's what you get. So this is the perfect case for SDFGI. I think it looks amazing. It runs super fast, uh, and it works really well. But that scene is a scene that is an ideal candidate for SDFGI. So it's got a big light source. It's got nice, chunky, chunky geometry. And the performance is good, but we know we can make it better. Uh, and then particularly where SDFGI struggles is when you're inside a, a closed room uh, and you have a small light source, then things look a little bit wonky and we know we can improve that and so we are going to do that. Um, and we're going to do that by improving SDFGI. <laughs> we're going to have better performance. Um, we're going to add more accuracy. So this is a uh, weird visualization about how we do that. Uh, and it's by separating our data into a few different formats. And then we're going to do some, some trickery with uh, with the UN64 format in order to get more accuracy. Um, we're hoping this will uh, eliminate light leaks. Um, and then on top of that, we want to add dynamic object support. So before I called it a dynamic system, it's dynamic in the sense that when you move the sun, uh, all the lighting changes. Um, but it doesn't capture lighting from, uh, for example, your character who's carrying a lantern or something around. Um, the the contribution from the person won't be there. You'll just have the lighting from, from the lantern, and that can be a bit uh, problematic. OK, so I'm running short on time, so I'm going to blast through these and then open the floor for questions. Um, these are some of our long-term ideas. So we've been talking about ray tracing. Uh, we've been talking about a GPU-driven renderer, and we've been talking about writing a pluggable renderer through a GD extension. So uh, if you're not familiar with ray tracing, um, it's really uh, a new technology that's not going anywhere, and it's the future of, of rendering. Uh, we'd like to introduce some, uh, some effects using ray tracing, starting with shadows, GI reflections. We're talking about eventually having a ray tracing-based renderer. 
Um, and, and this just allows us to get closer to ground truth, which is you know, realistic looking stuff, um, but it's a very long-term plan for us. And it has to fit in with um, our plans for GPU-driven renderer. Now this is another modern technique. It's been around for 10 years or so. It's used in, in all the big kind of games. Uh, it allows you to write things faster. Um, it allows you to stress your GPU a little bit more and it works really well combined with, with ray tracing. So we're talking about how we can make something like this uh, in a way that doesn't take too many resources away from, from other developments. And, and as such, it's, it's a very long um, timeline for us to get something like this. And then finally, um, we want to have a pluggable renderer through GD extension. So the idea there is you would write your own renderer uh, compile it into a GD extension, and then you know you could ship that out. You could put it on on the asset library, and then people could just plug in a totally different renderer. So maybe something that's optimized for non-photorealistic rendering, or something that's optimized for a specific type of asset or a specific style, and you would just skip everything that we've written and all the work that we've done, um, and use your own thing. And 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 that's something we want to support, um, but. We know it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be hard to do right. Um, so uh, it's a long-term thing for us. Okay, any questions? Rund? So, yes, I'm going to be very eager. I have two questions, if that's okay. First of all, you mentioned having sets of passes where one set could end and lead into another set starting. Could that lead to a, a, a situation where a, a frame essentially never finishes rendering because it's stuck in an infinite loop of rendering sets? No. Uh, you specify what, how many passes you want to do uh, in advance, and you specify what goes in each pass. So uh, you, there's a limited number that you can have, and you choose what that number is. Hello, I'm curious why vertex lighting wasn't implemented in 4.0 and was it because of priority or why? Because there are many mobile devs and also some devs that like to do retro styled graphics like me or like HP Swan and yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good question and <laughs> the answer is unfortunately a bit long. So I'll give you the short answer and it's um, limited resources A and the difference between uh, our hired resources and community resources. So for certain things that are more medium priority and that take less technical skill to implement, we kind of wait until somebody from the community does it um, because we want to be able to engage those resources. If we ourselves, the, the hired team, do everything that's easy, then there's nothing left for the, the community to do. And so that's something that just unfortunately uh, took a long time, uh, but should be coming in 4.3. So there's someone that uh, implements it. There's a PR, and uh, could it be re-added to 4.2, or is it like too late for that? Um, it's too late, unfortunately. Uh, our goal is to release 4.2 in the next couple of weeks. So uh, it, it came in kind of after we had uh, frozen features and we were in late betas. So uh, it's something that's coming soon, but uh, not next week. Sorry, me again. Um, the RD renderer, is that targeted specifically towards PC hardware or are there, is it, uh, are there considerations or do there need to be considerations for it to be suitable for consoles, Xbox, particularly the Switch? So the RD renderers uh, actually run on almost all of our supported platforms. The only exception right now is web. Um, so they, they run over Vulkan, which is supported on um, some consoles. Um, and it's supported on desktop and, and mobile. Uh, soon, browsers are going to ship web GPU, which will allow us to run the RD renderer over web. Um, and then the RD renderer also abstracts over D3D12, Metal, uh, secret console APIs that we can't talk about. So the RD renderer will run everywhere. Uh, and the compatibility renderer will only run places that run OpenGL. Um, so that it's slightly more limited, but right now it's what supports mobile and web the best. 
three more questions, and I have one from this side, I guess. Uh, so you mentioned uh, being able to write custom uh, shader templates. So are those going to be written in like the, the usual shader language that Godot uses, or are those like GLSL? They'll be raw GLSL. Ah, okay. which our, our shader language is raw GLSL with a few things added on top of it. So we're hoping that the uh, it's not too difficult for, for users, but it, it is a very advanced feature, and it's intended for, for advanced users. So it's not going to be quite as easy as, as what we currently offer with GD shaders. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you didn't talk about direct 3D, and uh, we, we, there is our PR for it, and uh, what is the plan with that? The plan for direct 3D was to merge it for 4.2, um, but we decided not to in the end as there was some tweaks we wanted to make, and we want to make sure that once it, it lands in upstream, it's exactly how we want it to be. And unfortunately, being such a large feature that comes with hundreds of thousands of lines of code, we need to prioritize making sure that Godot itself remains lean and mean and easy to build and easy to work with. And so merging something that's hundreds of thousands of lines of code actually takes a lot of uh, process for us. Um, technically, it works. You can merge the PR into your own branch, and it works great. Um, but we want to figure out some things on the Git side and on the process management side to make it actually feasible for us to ship builds with D3D uh, enabled. Um, and so that just took a bit more time than we expected. So it. Yes. Can you rep <laughs> repeat it, Clay? Can you repeat what he said, just please? Hein Peter said this is a fun building to talk about D3D 12 issues in. <laughs> because there are unfortunately process issues around merging Microsoft code into an open source project. <laughs> oh. Not well, that we're not thankful. We don't have to go into this year. <laughs> um, is there one last question? We have time for one last question if somebody wants to know something. Yep. I go to you. <laughs> Thank you. So if you allow people to plug into the rendering pipeline at various points, that will that also mean that you are less flexible in the future about changing how that pipeline works? Because now people are dependent on the particular shape and the order of things are happening in. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's one of the reasons why we've held off for so long on doing something like this. Because uh, ultimately, the, the callback the user receives is going to have a set of inputs and a set of outputs, and now we can't change those. We can add more inputs, we can add more outputs, but we can't take anything away. So if we decided that for the, for example, for the performance of our, our default rendering pipeline, we want to totally remove some buffer, we have to figure out some way of maintaining that for users who are using it. So it's something that takes a long time to add because we need to be confident that the way things are, we're gonna be happy with in five years, and that's a hard thing to do. But yeah, that, that's a great question. We, we are quite a bit more limited now in, in the changes we can make. Thank you very much, Clay. Thank you.